Hello and welcome to podcast number 23 in my series, Colonies to Colossus, The Rise of a Giant. In this podcast, we're going to take a look at the French Empire in North America. Most people are aware that there is something French going on in Canada, but where that French influence came from and what it was once a part of are not so easily obvious. The French once built an empire that extended from Canada's St. Lawrence River Valley in the northeast, westward into the Great Lakes, and as far west as modern-day Minnesota. From here, their empire extended south along the Mississippi River to the Gulf of Mexico. It was an empire that extended through the heartland of the United States. Before it ended, it was the largest empire built by Europeans in North America. The names of French noblemen, missionaries, and explorers still ring in the ears of Americans and Canadians today. Names like... Sorel, Cartier, La Roche, Champlain, Lejeune, Nicolette, Duquesne, Talon, La Salle, Pontchartrain, Cadillac, La Suer, Hennepin, Joliet, Duluth, Marquette, and Beauregard. If you take a careful look at a modern-day map of the city of Minneapolis, you'll find many of these names in some of the main streets that run downtown. Several important American cities were founded by the French and still retain their original French names, including Detroit, New Orleans, Baton Rouge, and St. Louis. We still pronounce some Indian words using French pronunciation, words like Quebec, Canada, and Illinois. The French were fearless explorers who constantly pushed west, looking for a way to the Pacific Ocean. Some of them came within the sight of the Rocky Mountains. The size of the French domains in North America are somewhat deceiving. The French really never had enough colonists to actually occupy or control all of it. Combined with feeble handling of Indian affairs, the French Empire was probably not destined for long life. Her colonies cost France more than they produced. After Columbus's expedition, other monarchs in Europe began to get interested in how they might cash in on the Western Hemisphere and its wealth. As early as the 1520s, the King of France had hired an Italian explorer named Verrazzano to explore what would today be the eastern seacoast of the United States. Spain objected to these actions because the Pope had given them all of North America. But the Protestant Reformation had seriously weakened papal power, and the papacy was in no position to offend another strong Catholic country like France, and so France decided to proceed. The King of France is reported to have said, The sun shines on me as well as others. I fain would see Adam's will to learn how he partitioned the world. And with that, France began undertaking colonization efforts. In 1534, Jacques Cartier discovered the St. Lawrence River, which runs right into the heart of Canada. He explored the river and set up a French settlement. Unfortunately, the settlement didn't last long. Also, the French had set up some settlements down in what today would be South Carolina and Florida. Both of these were wiped out and massacred by the Spanish. In 1608, Samuel de Champlain, also known as the father of New France, made another attempt to explore and settle the region. He founded the city of Quebec on a defensible outcrop of rock and pushed forward westward to the Great Lakes. The French assumed at first that the Great Lakes must be a bay or reservoir of the South Sea, which today we call the Pacific Ocean. They didn't give up hope for decades that somehow these large inland lakes would somehow lead to a river or connect them to the Pacific Ocean. They really had no concept of how big the North American continent was. The French then spent the next phase of their explorations exploring the Great Lakes and establishing forts and trading posts at strategic locations on the Great Lakes. Two of these still exist today. One is Detroit, which is French for the Straits, and the other one is pronounced Sault Ste. Marie, which in English looks more like it would be pronounced Salt Ste. Marie. These forts were in strategic locations to control trade and traffic between the lakes. Not knowing what to call these lakes, the French often just simply named these great lakes after the nearest friendly Indian tribe. Many of the French explorers left colorful and interesting accounts of their explorations of the Great Lakes. One of them left this account of an animal he had apparently never seen before. He said this animal has a muzzle mighty big. I have seen some that have the nostril so big that I put into it my two fists at once with ease. He feeds like an ox, so but seldom he gallops. I have seen some of their horns that a man could not lift them from the ground. They are branchy and flat in the middle. And it's generally assumed that he was describing a moose. The French weren't the first to see the Mississippi River. The Spanish did that. But the French were the first to discover its source in what is today modern Minnesota and to navigate it from top to bottom. The Spanish had reported a river that emptied into the Gulf of California. 
The French were hoping the Mississippi River was that river. Now today we know that's not. We know that the river that the Spanish were referring to is the Colorado River. And after exploring the Mississippi River, they were very disappointed that it wasn't the river going into the Gulf of California. But they continued to hold out hope that one of its tributaries perhaps emptied out into the Pacific Ocean. In 1673, two explorers, Louis Joliet and Jacques Marquette, despite being disappointed that the Mississippi River didn't empty into the Gulf of California, did describe the country that it went through in very glowing terms. In a report to the governor, Governor Frontenac, Joliet described the river as passing between Florida and Mexico to empty into the sea, crossing the most beautiful country that has ever been seen. I have never seen, even in France, anything more beautiful than the prairies I have admired here. Nothing could be more pleasing than the variety of groves and forests where one may gather plums, apples, pomegranates, lemons, mulberries, and other small fruits not known in Europe. There are quail in the fields, brilliant parrots in the woods. In the river one catches wondrous fish hitherto unknown. Iron mines and copper, slate, saltpeter, coal, marble, and sandstones are abundant. The buffalo go in herds, some of them 400 in number. Wild turkeys are so common that they are not valued. The Indians raise three crops of maize a year and refreshing watermelons. In 1682, a party of French and Indian allies explored the Mississippi to where it empties into the Gulf of Mexico. The leader of the party was a man named La Salle. He named the region Louisiana in honor of King Louis XIV. Louisiana had real potential for growth because unlike Canada, you could grow a lot of products there, including tobacco, rice, indigo, silk, cotton, and even some wheat. Louisiana attracted people from other parts of Europe, including Germany, Holland, and Switzerland. In order to build up Louisiana's agricultural industry, French authorities imported large numbers of African slaves, and it wasn't long before Louisiana kind of resembled a poorer version of English South Carolina, where there were more slaves than free men. And like the English in South Carolina, the French in Louisiana lived in constant terror of slave uprisings. A thin string of forts, trading posts, and small settlements scattered between Louisiana and the Great Lakes connected Louisiana and Canada. One of these settlements was St. Louis, which the French founded in what is today modern Louisiana. What's interesting about St. Louis is what's across the Mississippi River from it. Eastward, just a short distance, is the Indian settlement of Cahokia, where large mounds of earth constructed pyramids resemble somewhat the Aztec ruins down in Mexico. Cahokia must have once been a large, thriving Indian metropolis. France's colonies remained chronically underpopulated throughout most of their existence. And even though France had more than twice the number of people as England did, they couldn't get colonists to go over there. In France, Catholicism was the only legal religion. Dissenters were persecuted. The French colonies didn't allow dissenters or Protestants to come and live in them. So in a way, the French colonies never acted as a relief valve as they did for England, where dissenters found haven and refuge. As many as 10,000 French Huguenots fled to the English colonies. Among these was a man named Apollos Rivois, who was the father of our famous Paul Revere, who anglicized his name to better fit in with the Yankees of Massachusetts. French colonial government was autocratic and there were no elected representative assemblies. One can certainly see why the English colonies seemed like a better place to go. Indians and Europeans attempted to use each other against their traditional enemies, and this was certainly the case with what happened to the French and their Huron Indian allies. The Huron Indians occupied the area around the Great Lakes. They were in need of firearms because their traditional enemy, the Iroquois, were getting firearms from the Dutch. The French needed trading partners as well as military assistance because the French colony in Canada probably wouldn't have lasted without Indian allies for very long. So the French allied with the Huron Indians, which automatically made them enemies of the Iroquois Confederation. The Iroquois occupied mostly what is western New York today in the Finger Lakes District. That would have been the heartland of the Iroquois territory. My next podcast will be about the Iroquois, as a matter of fact. The Huron Indians believed that tobacco had magical properties, or at least spiritual properties. One Frenchman described how the Huron Indians used tobacco when they killed bears. He said, as they kill them, they light their pipes and put the pipe in their mouth. They push the smoke out by the nostrils of this animal. I thought that was kind of funny. Here you can almost picture the, the dead bear smoking this pipe. In the 1640s, the Iroquois went on a war of extermination against the Huron Indians, and the French were not very much able to help them, which made them look weak. Having destroyed many of the French allied Huron Indians around the Great Lakes, the Iroquois then focused on the French in the St. Lawrence River Valley, and the French only managed to survive by a hair's breadth. 
I think these devastating raids by the Iroquois really set the French back. Down in Louisiana, the French took a similar course when they allied with the Choctaw Indians. The Choctaw wanted firearms because many of their traditional enemies that lived closer to the coast were getting firearms from the English. The French not only relied on the Choctaw's allies, but they also relied on them to return runaway slaves and deserters. They also relied on the Choctaw as a counterweight towards the Chickasaw Indians. And in fact, they actually paid the Choctaw Indians for every Chickasaw slave or scalp that they brought into them. In all of these cases, the Indian relationships and alliances that the French made were based on gifts. The French had to keep the gifts going or they couldn't maintain the alliances. This is one of the reasons that the French colonies were so expensive to administer, was the constant gifts they had to lavish on their Indian allies to keep their alliances going. In dealing with the Indians, the French kind of took a middle route between the English and the Spanish. The English were pretty much segregationists. They didn't want the Indians in town, although they did want to trade with them and have commercial relations, whereas the Spanish were there to conquer the Indians and assimilate them. The French, it is true, wanted to assimilate the Indians, but they never had the military power really to do it. So they relied on trying to get along with them and buying their loyalty with gifts. Some of the bravest and most intrepid French colonists were French missionaries who went out to try and convert the Indians to Catholicism. They not only acted as missionaries, but also as go-betweens and people who could speak with the Indians for the French government. Many of them died after cruelly being tortured to death, and others died of exposure out in the endless forests that they traversed. I think overall the French missionaries were an asset to the French colonial effort. From the beginning, Canada's economy revolved around the fur trade, and that never really changed. Originally, Canada was run by a private company that was not so interested in building the colony as it was in the profits that it could make for its company owners. In 1663, the king took over administration of Canada, and somewhat the situation improved because the king was more interested in colony building and sending colonists over. Unfortunately, Canada never really produced as much as it cost to operate the colony. One French official lamented, we should never delude ourselves that our colonies on the continent could ever rival the neighboring English colonies in wealth, nor even be commercially very lucrative. For with the exception of the fur trade, the extent to which it is limited and the profits continually declining, these colonies can furnish only goods similar to those of Europe at higher prices and of poorer quality. As I mentioned earlier, Canada's low population meant that it never really could move beyond subsistence agricultural and into commercial activity. The low population of the French colonies and the fact they couldn't produce much wealth made them easy pickings and they were eventually absorbed by the English after the French and Indian War. I'll have a separate podcast on the French and Indian War later, down the road. For further reading on this topic, I recommend the following books and articles. French and Indians in the Heart of North America, 1630-1815, edited by Robert Engelbert and Guillaume Teasdale. The Edge of the Woods, Iroquois, 1534-1701, by John Parmenter. Masters of Empire, Great Lakes Indians and the Making of America, by Michael A. MacDonald. The Colonial Americas, by John Francis Bannon. Chapters 16 and 17 of the book American Colonies, by Alan Taylor. The French Regime in the Great Lakes Country by Louise Phelps Kellogg, published in the Minnesota History, Volume 12, Number 4, December 1931, and France and the Mississippi Valley, a resume by Louise Phelps Kellogg, published in the Mississippi Valley Historical Review, Volume 18, Number 1, June 1931.